Hi, my name is Dave Matlock, and I'd like to welcome you to the system overview portion of this training video. The Environment One grinder pump system consists of several components, which include a tank, a pump, a power cable, and an alarm panel. Environment One offers a variety of different styles of pumps, tanks, and panels, but the most common styles that we have out in the field today are the wet well version and the dry well version. The basic differences between these two different types of pumps is how they're supported in the station and how the liquids are discharged from the system. On the basic wet well system, the pump is supported in the station by a stand which rests on the bottom of the tank and the liquids are discharged through a flexible discharge hose which typically attaches to a slide face valve assembly within the station itself. The dry well version is supported in the station by a top housing which rests on a deck or transition between the dry well portion and the wet well portion of the tank. It's secured in the tank by a latching mechanism and the liquids are discharged through a stainless steel discharge tube that attaches to a ball valve assembly within the station itself. Different panels that we have are the basic simplex panel there. Again, this is the most common panel that we have, but we do also offer duplex panels, protect plus panels, as well as a couple of other styles of panels. Regardless if it's a dry well, wet well version, or the wet well version, all of the Environment One Extreme Series grinder pumps are a one horsepower, 1725 RPM, semi-positive displacement progressive cavity style grinder pump. Starting at the bottom on either one of these, we have a large diameter inlet shroud where the liquids and the solids come together. The liquids and the solids then pass through a cutter wheel and shredder ring configuration where the solids are ground into fine particles and mixed with the liquids into a slurry state. That slurry will then pass through the progressive cavity portion of the pump which consists of a stainless steel rotor and a rubber stator. The stator portion is contained within this casting right here which we call the suction housing. This suction housing is then attached to what we call the motor head portion of the pump. The motor head portion also has an integrated discharge elbow on it which we attach a check slash anti-siphon valve to keep liquids from coming back into the station when the pump shuts down and to avoid siphoning the station dry when the pump shuts off. Located within the motor head, we also have a mechanical seal which acts as a water barrier between the motor head and the motor casting. In the motor casting here, you'll notice that it's a streamlined rib design and the actual motor stator is pressed into the casting. This allows us to transfer and dissipate heat more rapidly throughout the system. When we designed this pump, we designed it to be rated for 80 PSI or roughly 184 feet of head. The motor itself is a 120 volt or 240 volt multi-tap motor stator. It can be used on either one of those voltage levels depending on the source that's available at the site. On top of the motor casting we have what we call the control compartment which contains the control bracket which basically tells the pump when to come on and off in conjunction with switches that are located within this level center assembly right here. Either style pump here, it doesn't matter if it's the dry well or the wet well version, both have the controls enclosed within a cast cover. On the dry well version, we have a top housing that attaches to the top of the control compartment cover. And this is there again what I said, how it's attached and how it rests and is supported within the station itself. There again on the back side here, we have the check valve slash anti-siphon assembly, stainless steel discharge tube on this format and we have the flexible discharge hose on the wet well version. The Environment One Extreme Series grinder pump is utilizing pressure switches rather than floats to control the on-off operation and the high water level alarms within the system. We've developed a modular design on this pump which is utilizing this device right here which we call the level sensor assembly. Within the level sensor assembly, we have two switches. The primary switch is an on-off switch, and the secondary switch is a high water alarm level switch. Due to the fact that we're utilizing pressure switches rather than floats, it's extremely important that we maintain ambient pressure within the entire system. The way this level sensor assembly works is we basically set the pump down in the station. The normal off level is going to be approximately right here. 
So when we set the pump in the station, we're actually capturing a column of air with these sensing bells. As the water level moves up and down, the pressure will increase and decrease within these columns, which will activate or deactivate the switches within the compartment itself. There again, the normal off level is right here, which is approximately 14 inches from the bottom of the station. The normal on level is about right here, or approximately 18 inches from the bottom of the station. And the high level alarm is approximately 26 inches from the bottom of the station. There again, like I said, due to the fact that we're utilizing pressure switches rather than floats, it's extremely important that we maintain ambient pressure within the entire operating system. In order to do that, we're utilizing an equalizer and an equalizer tube. Basically, as the water level moves up and down within the system, the pressure within the columns will increase and decrease proportionally. As that occurs, the pressure switches have diaphragms within them that will expand and contract accordingly with the pressure that's in the columns. As those diaphragms in those switches expand and contract, the pressure that's in this compartment will change as well. So what we've done is we have a barbed fitting that sits on top of the level sensor assembly in which this equalizer tube attaches. That allows the air as the pressure changes within this compartment to move back and forth in this tube. This tube is then attached to what we call the equalizer assembly. This equalizer assembly also has a diaphragm that's sandwiched between the two halves of the shell that will expand and contract as well as that pressure changes within that tube. On the sides of the front side of the equalizer assembly, there's weep holes which will allow that air to move back and forth in and out of this portion of the equalizer assembly and into the station itself. Therefore, it's extremely important that our stations are vented. All the vents on this type of station are located at the top of the tank right underneath this portion of the lid. So as this diaphragm expands and contracts, air will be allowed to move in and out of the well portion of the station and allow proper equalization to occur and maintain ambient pressure within the entire operating system. In this portion of the system overview, I'd like to talk about exactly how the Environment One Series grinder pump stations work. If you refer to chapter three, page 11 of your service manual, you'll find a road map for the 240 volt system. This road map is broken down into a few different sections. If you look in the top left hand corner you'll see that's where the main supply power is coming into the system. Over to the right we have our alarm circuits. And down here on the bottom we have the pump portion itself. Over here is our main supply panel. The pump is rated for 240 volts plus or minus 10 percent which gives us an operating range of 216 to 264 volts. Due to the fact that we're doing 240 volts on this system, you need to have two different legs of 120 volts coming in from your source. There again, the alarm circuits are rated for 120 volts, so we'll need one leg of 120 volts coming in with a neutral wire. Forgot to mention, this is rated for 120 volts plus or minus 10 percent, which gives us an operating range of 108 to 132. You'll also notice that there's a ground coming in from the source as well which is tied to the ground bus inside the alarm panel itself. So we have four wires coming in from our source. It's extremely important that all four of these wires are there. You'll also notice that we're recommending 30 amp dedicated service for our supply power to the entire system. What I'd like to do in this portion is to identify the wires that we're using in our six conductor tray cable. The green wire is the ground wire and it's attached directly to the ground bus inside the panel. The red wire we're going to call pump power L1. The black wire we call pump power L2. Now when we get over here to the alarm circuits we'll have the brown wire, the yellow wire, and the blue wire attached to a terminal right here on the circuit board. I'm going to call this brown wire three different things depending on exactly how it's being utilized at any given time during the operation of the pump. I'll call it L1 control, I'll call it redundant run, 
and I'll also call it manual run. This brown wire is pretty much the key to the entire operation of the pump system down below. The yellow wire is what we call alarm feed. This wire should always be hot coming off of the alarm circuits. It goes down and feeds into the level sensor assembly where the alarm switch is located. And then we have the blue wire, which we call alarm return, which also goes down into the level sensor and ties to the alarm switch as well. Now when we get down here to the pump in portion, I want to talk about a few different things. I want to talk about the motor and I want to talk about the controls. Inside the control compartment we have the control bracket which contains a contactor, a capacitor, a start switch, and a thermal protector. Contactor 101 tells me that you need to have a contactor with a coil and you need to have contacts on it. The way that this contactor operates is when you have voltage applied to the coil, it will become energized and will create an electromagnetic field which will draw in a plunger of sorts and change the state of the contacts. Due to the fact that this portion is rated for 240 volts, that means that we need to have one leg of 120 volts on one side of the coil, another leg of 120 volts on the other side of the coil. There's really only one thing that needs to happen in order for this pump to run. We need to have 240 volts applied to the motor. If you look at your road map, you'll notice that the black motor wire is coming off right here. It's butt spliced to a thermal protector on the control bracket and the other wire comes all the way back from the thermal protector and ties into the A1 terminal on the contactor. You may also notice that the black L2 pump power wire is also tied in at the A1 terminal on the contactor. That wire goes all the way back up and all the way back to the breaker inside the alarm panel. So with that said, that tells me that I constantly have the L2 leg being applied to one side of the coil and to one side of the motor. So really, the only other thing that needs to happen is I need to get the L1 leg to the other side of the motor and to the other side of the contactor coil in order to energize that and change the state of the contacts. Well, let's look at the L1 red wire for just a second. That red one L wire actually comes off the double pole breaker inside the alarm panel, comes down through the cable, and splits at this T portion. One side of it goes into the level sensor assembly and is tied to pin one on the on-off switch. Let's follow it down the rest of the way. It tees and it comes down and it goes to one L1 on the contactor. You may notice that we have a series of jumpers in here as well that are tied to one L1, three L2, and five L3. So basically, we're utilizing three sets of contacts to transfer one leg of power over to the other side of the contactor and try to get that 240 volts applied to the motor and make the pump come on. So there's one thing that needs to happen. Got to get that 240 volts over to the pump motor so the pump will come on. There's three ways that we can make that happen. There again, earlier I stated that the brown wire was the key to the whole operation of this pump. Since we already have L2 being applied to the A1 terminal of the contactor, all we have to do is get L1 power onto the brown wire to the other side of the coil, which will in turn energize the contactor, engage the contacts, and transfer the L1 power from the 1L1 terminal across the contactor to the blue motor wire and give me 240 volts on the motor. There again, there's three ways that we can make that happen. The primary way is the on-off switch. The on-off switch is contained within the level sensor assembly and as we saw earlier, 1L1, or excuse me, the L1 power wire is coming down and tying directly to pin one of the on-off switch. When the water level rises enough to activate or close that switch, we'll then transfer L1 power across the switch to the brown wire. It will go down the brown wire and over to the A2 terminal, energizing the contactor and transferring power over to the motor and bringing the pump on. In that mode, I'm going to call the brown wire L1 control because I'm controlling L1 power from the red wire across the switch to the brown wire. 
The secondary way that we can bring this pump on is through redundant run circuits that are located within the alarm panel. This alarm panel basically serves five functions. It gives me a visual indication with the light that there's high water in the station. It gives me an audible indication with the buzzer. It gives me redundant run when the panel's in alarm. It gives me the ability to silence the buzzer. And it also gives me the ability to manually run the pump as well. So let's back up to that second way that I can activate this pump and make it run. The alarm switch through the redundant run circuits located in the alarm panel. There again, I said earlier that this yellow wire should always be hot. Okay, it's going to come down here and tie to the pin number one on the alarm switch. When the water level reaches a level high enough to activate that switch, that power will transfer across that switch to the blue alarm return wire, which in turn will come up and activate the alarm circuits within the panel. When these alarm circuits activate, the light will go off, I'll hear the buzzer sound, the redundant run relay will energize, and when that happens, I'm going to send power, L1 power, down the brown wire, there again to the contactor, energizing it, changing the state of the contacts, and transferring power over to the motor. So the primary way is with the on-off switch, Brown's being utilized for L1 control. Secondary way is the utilization of the alarm switch and the redundant run circuits within the alarm panel to energize this and bring the pump on. There's really only one other way that we can bring this pump on, and that's with a manual run switch that's located within the alarm panel right here on the circuit board. When I press that switch, I will put L1 power onto the brown wire there again, bringing it down to the contactor, energizing the coil, engaging the contacts, and transferring power over to the motor. 